The EMN5 for today is going to be on calcium channel blocker toxicity. Now here's this famous one pill can kill list, meaning that very low doses of these can cause high toxicity, so especially in pediatrics where they can take one pill and have major medical implications. And guess who should happen to be on this list but calcium channel blockers. There are 10 calcium channel blockers on the market right now. These are probably the ones we're most familiar with. I think of them as diltiazem, verapamil, and the epines, so amlodipine, nifedipine, and these are all class 4 antiarrhythmics. So as much as I know you're all going to hate me for this, let's do a little biochem review. Where is calcium stored? That's right, in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and when it comes out of the SR, what does it do? Good, it causes contraction of smooth muscles. And what causes this release to happen? calcium channel blockers. So it's the L-type voltage operated calcium channel that our medications act against. Now to think about what systemic effects you see in calcium channel blocker toxicity, you need to think about where these channels are. One location that all these medications act on are the calcium channels in vascular smooth muscle. And if that muscle can't contract from toxicity, you're going to get hypotension. And that's one of the main side effects of calcium channel blockers. And that makes sense, right? We give calcium channel blockers for patients with hypertension. We want to lower their blood pressure. And if they take too much, they're going to get hypotension. Another location of these calcium channels are in the myocardium and also the pacemaker cells in the heart. Now it's more diltiazem and verapamil that act on these channels. And this can cause bradycardia, both first, second, and possibly third degree heart block. So we talked about hypotension and bradycardia. Nifedipine can actually cause a reflex tachycardia. So remember, hypotension is the one they all act on. Bradycardia is some. Other clinical effects you can see is hyperglycemia. This happens from both an inhibition of insulin release and also systemic resistance to insulin. You can also see metabolic acidosis. If your cardiovascular effect is significant enough, you can see signs of CHF. And on your EKG, you might see QT prolongation and possibly torsades. The effect of calcium channel blocker medications is actually pretty fast. The immediate release, you'll see effects in about two to three hours, and in the sustained release tabs, about six to eight hours. Now in treatment of calcium channel blocker toxicity, you of course always want to do this in conjunction with the poison control center or a toxicology consult. First you want to think of decontamination. You should use activated charcoal. The recommendation is usually one to two grams per kilogram or about 50 to 100 grams. And you should think about using whole bowel irrigation if they take sustained release tabs. For any toxicity, you need to think about your ABCs. And in this case, with hypotension being our main side effect, it's especially important. So for hypotension, just treat with IV fluids, compressors, nor Epi or epi are good choices. And for bradycardia, you can try atropine, just the code doses. That said, in calcium channel blocker toxicity, while you need to give support for your EBCs, that might not always be effective. And these are some other adjuncts you can add to your therapy if you're having refractory hemodynamic instability. These are going to be calcium, this high insulin infusion protocol, glucagon, or a lipid emulsion. So let's go through each of these quickly. For calcium, you can either do calcium chloride or calcium gluconate. And this makes sense, right? You're trying to add back that calcium that you're sequestering in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, it's not quite all that simple, but there have been cases to show that calcium can be helpful, especially in refractory bradycardia. And you may find that your atropine is more effective after you've given the calcium. Glucagon is suggested as an adjunct more because of case reports. There's not really a lot of good evidence for this, and that's mostly because of the similarity to beta blocker toxicity. This high-dose insulin infusion is pretty interesting. They found that in refractory hypotension and hemodynamic instability, high, high doses of insulin can actually help. So this isn't for hyperglycemia. This is actually for hemodynamic instability, and these doses are high. Your infusion is 0.5 to 1 units per kilogram per hour. That's high. In DKA, you're doing 0.1 units per kilogram per hour. And here you're titrating to hemodynamic stability. You're definitely going to need to replete glucose as you go and check point of care glucoses every one hour during this infusion. You'll also probably need to replete potassium during this infusion. And lastly, lipid emulsion. This is where you give intralipid, first as a bolus and then as an infusion. Now you need to think about your disposition for this patient. And it all comes down to that timing that we talked about before. So if we said before that symptoms should start to show up within six to eight hours, that's how long you need to observe the patient for. If they're completely asymptomatic, symptomatic while you observe them in the ER for six to eight hours, you can probably send them home. If they're symptomatic either when they enter the door or within your observation period, they need to go to the tele unit or an ICU. So three to remember from this talk. The main effects of calcium channel blocker toxicity are hypotension and possibly bradycardia. These can be very hard to manage, so your treatment is mostly going to be support, 
Make sure you think about your ABCs and then start thinking about adjunct therapy if this patient is still unstable, such as calcium and that high dose insulin therapy that we talked about. Disposition, if they're asymptomatic, watch them for six to eight hours and you can possibly send them home. Make sure and do this in consult with the poison control center or a toxicologist. And if they are symptomatic, you should definitely send them to a tally unit or the ICU. Here's a quick summary of the treatment and thanks again for joining us on EMN5.